Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. Gruesome medicine through the ages. Corpse medicine. When we think about the history of medicine, I know that personally, I immediately think about the 19th century and the large lectures that showed a doctor or a surgeon performing live surgeries or dissections of a corpse to show the next generation and pass on knowledge. But what we don't think about is that even in our not so far away history, Europeans were cannibals. There is a famous question asked by a historian, and it wasn't should you eat human flesh, but instead, what sort of flesh should you eat? There is a poem by John Donne, written in the 17th century, that has a line reading, women are not only sweetness and wit, but mummy possessed. This line prompted Louise Noble, a lecturer in Australia, to look deeper into the meaning behind it, and she found that the word mummy reoccurs through early modern Europe, and it springs up in places such as Othello, the Fairy Queen, and Love's Alchemy. Mummies and other preserved and fresh human remains were found to be common ingredients in medicines of the time. For hundreds of years, peaking especially in the 16th and 17th century, Many Europeans, not limited to royalty, scientists and those of religious backgrounds, regularly ingested remedies that contained human bones, flesh, blood or fat as a medicine in the belief that it would cure anything from headaches to epilepsy. Interestingly, very few vocally opposed the practice within Europe and mummies were stolen from Irish burial grounds, Egyptian tombs and gravediggers saw a rise in work robbing and selling body parts. As I said at the beginning of this video, the question was not, should you eat human flesh, but instead, what sort of flesh should you eat? The first answer to this question was Egyptian mummy. It was believed that by crumbling said mummy into tinctures, internal bleeding could be stopped or restricted. It didn't stop there, however, and soon other body parts followed, with a skull being a common ingredient, it was thought that powdered skull, digested, would cure head ailments. Thomas Willis, a 17th century pioneer of brain science, brewed a drink for apoplexy, or bleeding, that mingled powdered human skull and chocolate. After King Charles II of England sipped the King's Drops, his personal tincture, containing human skull in alcohol, even the toupee of moss that grew over a buried skull called usney became a prized additive, its powder believed to cure nosebleeds and possibly epilepsy. Human fat went on to treat the outside of a person's body, and German doctors, for instance, would prescribe bandages soaked in human flat as well as rubbing said fat into the skin, as this was thought to be a remedy for gout. Blood was thought to contain the vitality of the body, and so it was obtained as fresh as possible. This factor meant that obtaining the blood was a challenge. In the 16th century, blood was even considered to be good for drinking, and followers of the physician even suggested taking blood from a living body. Could this possibly be where the idea of vampires come from? Drinking blood, however, wasn't actually common practice, yet it was the poor who supposedly benefited most from the cannibal medicine, for they could not afford compounds that were sold in apothecaries. So standing at the side of an execution and paying a small amount for a cup of still warm blood was really the only way for them to obtain medicine, if you could call it that. The executioner was considered a big healer in Germanic countries. He was a social leper with almost magical powers. For those who preferred their blood cooked, a 1679 recipe from a Franzician apothecary describes how to make it into marmalade. Today we know of the phrase placebo effect, and that was certainly what happened. You could push powdered moss up your nose to stop a nosebleed, or rub fat on an ache to stop the pain, or even have human flesh infused with alcohol to stop yourself from feeling depressed. Some of these remedies may have been incidentally helpful, but ultimately they work by magical thinking. It is believed that men and women thought along the lines of like cures like, so 
if you consumed ground up skull, it would cure a pain in the head, or drinking blood could cure a disease in the blood. Another reason human remains were used was due to the belief of their potency, as they supposedly contained a person's spirit. People believed that blood carried a person's soul, and therefore blood was the most powerful medicine. The freshest of blood was considered the strongest, and individuals even went as far as preferring the blood of either young healthy men, or a virginal young woman. Another interesting belief is that the person who consumed the corpse material ultimately gained the strength of the person being consumed. Leonardo da Vinci wrote, We preserve our life with death of others. In a dead thing insensate life remains which, when it is reunited with the stomachs of the living, regains sensitive and intellectual life. The idea wasn't new to the Renaissance, just newly popular. Romans drank the blood of slain gladiators to absorb the vitality of strong men. 15th century philosopher Marcillo Finci suggested drinking blood from the arm of a young person for similar reasons. Many healers in other cultures, including in ancient Mesopotamia and India, believed in the usefulness of human body parts. In history, there are two groups of individuals who were demonised. Their behaviours were deemed to be savage and ultimately cannibalistic. The first were Catholics. Protestants deemed the belief in transubstantiation, the bread and the wine changing into the body and blood of Christ, condemnable. The second group were the Native Americans. Negative stereotypes emerged and were justified, apparently, by the suggestion that they were cannibals. Those who practiced corpse medicine knew what the medicine contained, yet they refused to acknowledge their own cannibalistic implications of their actions and thus became hypocrites. There is a huge difference between New World cannibalism and European corpse medicine, in a sense that the non-Western practices were deeply social, and the relationship between the eater and the one who is eaten mattered. But in Europe, the process was mostly erased and made irrelevant. A human was made equal to any other kind of commodity medicine, and their value was ultimately erased to nothing. Thankfully, as science improved, cannibal remedies died out, and by the 18th century, the practice dwindled. This also coincides with the emerging of cutlery for eating and soap to bathe with. But even in the year 1847, examples were still found. An Englishman was advised to mix the skull of a young woman with treacle and fed it to his daughter to cure her epilepsy. Mummy was sold as medicine in a German medical catalogue at the beginning of the 20th century, and in 1908, a last known attempt was made in Germany to swallow blood at the scaffold. We have not moved on from using one human body to heal another. In England, for instance, and only with consent, individuals can benefit from blood transfusions, organ transplants and even skin grafts. These are all examples of a modern form of medicine from the body. But sadly, there is a black market trade in body parts for transplants, and these are somewhat closer to home than some would care to admit. In a disturbing echo of the past, some still believe that once a body is dead, you can therefore do what you want with it. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.